Billy Bragg, welcome to you. I mean, there was a lot in uh, Oliver Anthony's song that you quite liked. I mean, the, there are a lot of attacks, for example, on big businesses and, and the salaries they pay. Yeah, when he, when he opens up talking about, you know, he's working overtime hours for rotten pay, you know, I, I, I thought this is my kind of music. Um, you know, he, at one point he talks about, you know, people homeless on the street with nothing to eat. I mean, you know, these are the people we should be singing about. But then he, he immediately follows up by attacking the obese who he says are um, a milk in welfare. And I, it's kind of like took a sudden uh, right, I have to say, a sudden right turn. And he seemed to me to be having started talking about, you know, everybody and the troubles that they're facing. He suddenly started punching down and I found that a little bit troubling. But why shouldn't he be allowed to uh, grumble about uh, people who he perceives as uh, fiddling uh, welfare benefits? I mean, we know from uh, polling here in the UK that a lot of working class people in this country take a dim view of that. Yeah, it's true, but, you know, the majority of people on benefits are in work. I mean, that's the, that's the harsh reality. So by picking on the, you know, he says in the song, he talks about, he says, if you're under five foot three and 300 pounds, uh, and you're eating something called fudge rounds. Fudge rounds, I've found out, are a kind of uh, chocolate biscuit. Um, you know, the reasons why people might be overweight, why they might be comfort eating, are multi, you know, multitudinous. They're not doing it because they're, you know, living living high on on welfare payments. You know, and uh, Oliver Anthony, I understand myself, has had problems with with mental health. I mean, if you're a person who had a difficult childhood of always found it hard to hold down a job because of your mental health. You find, you know, that leads to you, you know, comfort. And there's nowhere where you live other than fast food places. You end up being overweight. You find a little bit of comfort in chocolate biscuits. I mean, are we really going to blame those people for the problems of the homeless on the street with nothing to eat? I don't think so. I think perhaps the problem might lie somewhere else, maybe. So uh, you've written a song in response to this. What uh, triggered you to, to go to take that particular approach? Well, triggered is a rather heavy word, I think, to use in. It's not so much being triggered. It's, there's, a, there's a great tradition of response songs in pop music, in country music. Woody Guthrie famously wrote This Land Is Your Land in response to God Bless America in 1940. So I thought maybe that's the way I can kind of talk to him because I don't think um, Oliver Anthony is a, a right-wing guy who's trying to stir up culture war. I think, like many of us, he's trying to make sense of a world in which it's difficult to find compassion. It's difficult to find empathy. I mean, I feel that all the time. So I thought maybe I could write a song that replied, that offered him a, you know, a, a suggestion of maybe coming together, you working with other people, artists. you know, trying to work out a way of resolving his problems. I was more like a, a advice, really. I'm not having a go at him. I mean, good luck to him. He's number one in America. I hope that this allows him to find a way to make a living making music because, you know, that's a real privilege to enjoy. But I just think the way he starts the song and then where it goes, the two don't really add up. So I just thought I'd give him some kind of comradely advice. <laughs> Do you think um, he's a product in, in a way of his society? Because he comes from Virginia, which, of course, is, is coal mining territory, yeah. but it has uh, a Democrat uh, representative yeah. who quite often sides with the Republicans yeah. and, and takes socially Mitchell, conservative yeah. causes. Yeah, It's a real problem. It's a real problem. I think more, in, more interestingly, I think you'll find that in terms of welfare, rural America benefit more in welfare payments than urban America. Because first of all, you've got farm subsidies. Farm subsidies are huge in the United States of America. Their farming industry would, particularly the small farmers, would collapse. So I think a lot of people that are, you know, living where he lives, he, live, he lives in a place called Farmville. I mean, <laughs> you can't get much more rural than that, could you? And I think that maybe, you know, maybe he's looked around and thought about the hard times he sees and he's trying to, you know, stir up some some compassion for those people who do feel that they're working jobs that are not getting anywhere. And I have a lot of compassion for those people as well. But the answer that he offers, which is to blame uh, overweight people, uh, to blame people on welfare, I think he's he's falling for the old trick that capital always plays, which is if he can get working people to argue with one another, if it can get them to argue about, you know, things like racial hierarchy, that's a very important issue in the United States of America. Or the culture wars, you know, arguing about those kind of things, arguing about bathrooms, then they won't be arguing about what Wall Street is doing to them, what Wall Street's done to their town, because that's where the problem is. There is a place north of Richmond that needs sorting out. It's Wall Street. Do you think uh, a chance was missed in the United States a few years ago? I mean, there was a guy called J.D. Vance, who's now a Republican politician, of course. He was a Wall Streeter, but he came from this sort of 
Appalachian background, you know, he wrote a book called Hillbilly Elegy, and a lot of people looked at that at the time and thought, well, maybe we need to explore some of the issues that he's talking about, opioid dependency, uh, um, for example. Has, has that chance been missed, do you think? In this song, I think perhaps there has. What he's done, he's kind of divided up the deserving poor, as he sees them, with what he thinks of as the undeserving poor. And I think that's really pernicious to do that. You know, if people are having a hard time, they need a bit of help. As I say in the song, you know, we're not going to punch down to people in need. Uh, we're not going to punch down to people who need a bit of understanding and some solidarity. And I think, unfortunately, you know, in a country as divided as the United States of America, a little bit more understanding between those people north and south of Richmond would really come in handy. And and I, and I don't think he does it intentionally. This is the thing, as I say, I've got nothing against Anthony um, and he's, where he's coming from. But un unintentionally, I think he's helped to stir up that division rather than ameliorate it. And I don't think that was in his intention of what he said about his politics. He said he's pretty much a down the middle of the aisle kind of guy. So I don't think he was particularly going out there to stir up shit like that Jason Alden song about um, try that in a small town. I mean, that really was, a, you know, a, someone who was trying to cause division. But I think Anthony uh, has just kind of put forward his ideas. He's not really just made the, the connections. And I was hoping with my song to be able to help him to make those connections. Billy, I must just apologise because you said a rude word there, so apologies to any of the uh, viewers who might have been offended by that. I'm, um, I'm, I'm so sorry. I do apologise myself. I didn't even realise I said it. I'm so sorry. But I have to go back and look what it was. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> what, what did I say? Uh, Socialism? Uh, no, no, it was a, a four-letter word. Um, what about... Um, you, you, the union movement. I mean, you, you've been singing about the unions for uh, forty years or more. You know, there was a power. In, there was a power in the union, and, and so on. How, how do you gauge the, the health of the union movement globally right now? Well, I think people are getting more organised. I mean, you know, I've, earlier this year, I was every week I was playing on a different uh, picket line. You know, the Royal College of Nursing were out on strike for the very first time. I was working with um, uh, the uh, ambulance drivers. I was out on strike with those the teachers as well, obviously been out on strike. And it was the same the last time I was in the United States of America. I was, uh, did a, a gig on a, a, a um, picket line outside of a Starbucks, a branch of Starbucks. And those those were, you know, they were kids. I mean, I know I'm an old guy and I'm 65, but the people organising there were all under 30. Some of them were under 20. And I think this is the way it is, particularly for the younger generations who realise that they are not going to be as, um, as well off or better off than their parents. They're looking around and thinking to themselves, well, what can we do about this? And one of the things... They can do. It doesn't solve all your problems, but one of the things you can do is organise in the workplace so you have a little bit of agency over your life, so you have a little bit of agency over the, the amount of um, shifts you have to work, what your hours are, what the health and safety is. These are really, really important things. And in the US, I mean, they have a lot of anti-union laws, so that's a really, really important issue to be putting across to people as a way of resolving or at least addressing their problems. OK. Billy, we've got to leave it there. 65 is the new 45, by the way. I wouldn't worry about that. Good to talk to you. <laughs> Thank you, mate.